Corey, and on behalf of Global Connections, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on Wine Century Evaluation, Flavor, Taste, and Mouthfeel. Please feel free to use the chat box for any questions or comments throughout the presentation. And if you have any trouble hearing or seeing any aspect of the presentation, please feel free to send me a message in the chat box. That's what I'm here for is to help you guys out. So I will now pass the microphone, microphone over mm -hmm. to Dr. Ross. And she will oh, sorry, this away for you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Carolyn Ross. I'm an associate professor here at the School of Food Science at WSU. I've been here nine years, and um, this is the third webinar in a series of three. The first webinar, we looked at appearance of wine, talked about how to evaluate it, some basic background concepts to keep in mind when you're thinking about wine sensory evaluation. In the second webinar, I talked about aroma, how those are perceived, different types of aromas, got a little bit into off aromas as well. And today, it's our final webinar. It's um, continuing with the theme of the basics of wine tasting, flavor, taste, and mouthfeel. And so I'm going to cover all those things today. So after today, you should have a lot of new knowledge to go forward into the world with. Outline of what I'm going to talk about today, we're going to first of all talk about taste properties, so different tastes and what, what kind of aspects they have within wine. Um, then I'm going to talk about factors affecting taste, and that's factors within the wine that affect our perception, and also factors within ourselves, the genetic differences that we may, we may have. I'm going to talk about flavors, and then we're going to get into mouthfeel. So what does the white wine feel like in the mouth? And so maybe that's not a term you may not be familiar with, but um, I'm sure you've heard of aspects of it. It's, it's basically the texture of the wine, what it feels like. Uh, then I'm going to talk about wine finish um, and some research that we've done in that area. And then finally finish up by talking about wine fault. And so that will kind of finish up in wine fault in the context of flavor and mouthfeel, not in aroma. We covered that in webinar two. So moving on, in mouth impressions, this is just an introduction of what we're going to talk about today. There's a, no a number of ways of looking at the product once it's in the mouth. There's looking at the taste of that particular wine. And in wine, we look at acidity, sweetness, and bitterness. We tend not to look at saltiness, although it may be an issue depending on where the wine is from. So you could look at saltiness. There's also umami, which is that kind of meaty or brothy note. And we don't, we don't look at that as well. That could be a flavor that you get. And you'll learn throughout this webinar the difference between taste and flavor. But it's generally not a taste that you perceive. So we look at those tastes, and those are receptors that are located on our tongue. So that's where we're perceiving those different tastes. Tactilely, those are receptors that are randomly scattered throughout the oral cavity. And so we pick up tactile or mouthfeel or in mouth or um, in mouth these in mouth impressions all over our mouth. And that's viscosity, the thick thickness of something. Um, texture, it could be gassiness, whether it's effervescent, so if you think of a sparkling wine, and then hotness. Um, it could be in terms of temperature, more, it would be more cold versus room temperature when we're talking about wine, or hotness in terms of alcohol concentration. So if something's very high in alcohol concentration, you could call it hot or burning. We do have two sets of chemoreceptors in the mouth. Our taste, we perceive on those receptor neurons, which are located on our tongue. And then mouthfeel, we have these three nerve endings that are randomly scattered throughout the oral cavity. And so when we talk about the technique used to evaluate wines, that's why you really want to swish it around and swirl it around, is to get to both of those different types of chemoreceptors. All of these things combine to produce flavor. Um, so you've got your taste, you've got your mouthfeel, and then you've got your flavors. And those are all kind of built in together as to what's going on with the wine once it's in your mouth. There's a lot to take in. But we're going to start with looking at basic taste. So um, I did mention we don't, we're not going to focus on salty when we talk about wine, but it is on this chart. And what it shows is that the sensitivity on, along the tongue. So along the bottom axis, we have the, the um, edge of the tongue, the location. And then we've got the sensitive, sensitivity along the, um, along the other axis. So and this is keeping in mind that there are, if you take in something that's very, very sweet, you're going to feel it all over your tongue. It's not just that you're going to feel it at the tip of the tongue, which is what this chart is showing. So if you look at the figure, we have sweetness. And it, you tend to feel that more at the tip of your tongue, and it tends to decrease in sensitivity as you go along the tongue and get to the back. Whereas bitterness has sort of the opposite relationship. It starts off, you're not maybe not picking up as much at the front of the tongue, but then you're picking up more as you get further back. And that then translates to reaction time, how long it takes us to detect something. 
But that's not to say that you would not feel bitterness at the front of your tongue if something was extremely bitter. Your sensitivity is just a little bit lower. So there was a diagram years ago that had just discrete sections of the tongue that were responsible for specific compounds. That's not the way it works. That your tongue is it's dynamic. It picks up all of those compounds. It's just there's certain love, um, locations of more or less sensitivity. But what this is, is suggesting is that reaction times vary based on the compound. So for sweetness, our reaction time is about 0.4 seconds. So if you take in something, a wine, a red wine, you might get, like, notice immediately that, hey, this is pretty sweet. And you notice that before, maybe you notice, whoa, now it's salty. But it just doesn't hit you right away because of the, the uh, look, concentration of those particular taste buds or taste receptors. We tend to notice bitterness later on. See, it can take up to a second to develop. So it could be after you swallow the wine or after you spit the wine out, then you think, wow, that was really bitter. You may not have noticed it straight away. And that's something to keep in mind when you're doing these evaluations, is you can tell or it hope, you can use that information to discern and tell the difference between sourness and bitterness. Sourness, we tend to feel along the sides of our tongue, and it tends to develop more quickly than bitterness, which is generally at the back of the tongue, and it tends to be more lingering. So you can use that information to help you figure out which kind of compounds you're, you're detecting. Now looking at vocabulary, with sweetness we have a few more terms than we say with bitterness. Um, with sweetness, in white wine it can range from bone dry, um, through dry, all the way up to very sweet. And that's because there's just a more of a range of sweetness levels that you're going to see in white wine. And there's also, I've noticed on the labels and Riesling, especially it, it gives you some information about how sweet this wine is. So whether it's medium dry or whether it's dry or whether it's sweet. Um, and so you're, you have that information when you're making a decision. So if you're looking for just a dry Riesling without a lot of sweetness, then you'll want to find one that says dry on the label. Um, red, we range from bone dry up to medium sweet. It doesn't have the same range of sweetness levels as white wine does. In bitterness, as I mentioned, it's more prominent in the wine finish. So not just say you wouldn't pick it up when the wine's in your mouth, but maybe after you've expectorated the wine or after you've swallowed the wines, you really kind of figure out or then it kind of strikes you, wow, that was really bitter. And then sourness, it can also be called acidity. Some people also call it tartness. Um, but there's some vocabulary here, green, tart, um, crisp, and then you start getting into the more of the sweet, like flabby or flat, and cloying or too sweet. And as far as um, sourness and sweetness goes, there is a balance there that we have. So if you've got a sweet wine, you wouldn't expect it, you know, when you know it's a sweet wine, it's a nice wine, it's a late harvest wine, you expect it to be quite sweet. You don't necessarily, you don't have the expectation that it's going to be like a table wine. So if you were, it's, it's a, a lot of it is about expectation. You may not have a balance in some of those wines, which is okay, as long as that's what the wine style is, is, um, is dictating. So for sweetness, again, you may have an ice wine that's very, very sweet and maybe just not a lot of sourness, but it's not meant to have that. Um, whereas for a table wine, you'd want more of, a, more of a balance. Okay, so now I've talked a little bit about this initially, but the action of tasting is, um, is very active. So there's, you want to take in about 10 mils of wine, which is about a third of an ounce, so, you know, or even half an ounce, so a good size mouthful. You want to move the wine around to the different parts of the tongue. So you really want to slosh it around. Sounds like you're almost gargling with it. And then and what we're doing there is we're trying to access it to the different parts of the tongue and of the whole palate so that you're able to perceive those flavors and, and mouthfeels and taste that we talked about. So you really want to slosh it around, almost gargle with it. And then if you can suck in air simultaneously, what you're doing there is you're releasing some of those volatile compounds that are captured. So. Um, it, it takes a little bit of practice. It's also very loud if you do it. So, um, you know, maybe try and practice in private first and then, then apply it. Uh, as far as how long you want to leave it in your mouth, what we do for our wine tastings is we suggest a residence time of about 10 seconds, meaning that leaving it in your mouth and really swishing it around for about 10 seconds is good. It's also, it's a long time. It's longer than you would normally leave a wine in your mouth. So you certainly don't have to leave it in your mouth that long. If it's also a very bitter or very astringent wine, you probably don't want to leave it in your mouth that long. But just try it with that 10 second residence time just to get a feel for how long that really is. Okay, so factors affecting taste perception. So there's a lot of things that affect how we perceive taste. And there's individual differences, which we'll talk about in a moment, but there's also chemical aspects. So what is going on in the wine itself? So you may have something called suppression, and that's where one compound suppresses the perception of another. 
So if you have a really high, sour, very, very acidic wine, it can suppress our suppression of sweetness. So you may not have a balance there. Um, enhancement, so certain compounds can enhance certain properties, and we'll talk about this when we talk about alcohol. But alcohol concentration can enhance the perception of certain things and decrease and suppress the perception of other things. So it's not just the compound itself and not just the concentration of that particular compound itself that is affecting the wine, but it's how it interacts with the other things that are also found in the wine. And that's a big part of my research, what I do now, is that I look at the interaction of the matrix. So I look at ethanol, I look at tannins, I look at the sugars, I look at other things that are in the wine and how those all interact together. Um, and then we may, also some of our compounds may have more than one sensory quality. So for example, tannins, they can be bitter and they can be astringent. And so then they, they can get a little bit confusing there. Glucose, which is sweet, um, it can be sweet, but it can also be a little bit acidic if it's at low concentrations. And same as alcohol, it, at low concentrations, it can be a little bit sweet, but it can also be, um, provide that burning, as we talked about. So some of these compounds, it's not just simply like they're just loading one particular parameter to the wine. It could be that they're inferring, conferring several properties to the wine. So again, it's very complicated. Um, now, for in individual differences, we're all different, so we perceive things differently. And so I'm going to spend a couple of slides talking about that, why you may be different than someone else or how you are um, different within yourself. You may not be consistent. Maybe you're sensitive to one thing but not to something else. And so we'll talk about individual differences. This is a, a slide showing individual sensitivities. So along the bottom we have, is there just some... They're just initials, and so those are the subject's names. And then we have along the, um, along the other axis, we have the sensitivity levels. And what I wanted to show here is that how some people are more or less sensitive to certain compounds. So if you look at GC, which is the first initial, that person is quite sensitive to sourness, but you know, not as sensitive to other things like saltiness. And so there's going to be a lot of variation. Just because you're sensitive to one compound doesn't mean you're sensitive to everything. It could be that you're just you're used to that compound, that there's been some um, that there's been some familiarity. You've maybe grown up consuming that compound, and so you've become used to it, and so you're familiar with it. So you're more sensitive to it. Or maybe you work if you work in a lab or you work in a particular uh, in a restaurant, you may become used to a particular compound, and so that can be learned sensitivity. So there is sort of a genetic difference, which we'll talk about next. There's also sort of a learned sensitivity. Also, over time, you can become desensitized to something. So if you really like spicy things, really, really like them, and you continue to have them, over time, you can become desensitized. I mean, that does take a little while, though. So there are changes that are genetic, and then, or there are um, differences because of genetics. There are also differences because of what we consume and what we have as habits. And so this next slide talks about being a super taster. So this is actually a genetic difference that we have. So super tasters um, show a taste blindness to 6N propylthiourosyl or prop. And this was discovered in the 1920s by Dr. Fox. And he was working in a lab, working with this particular compound and doing some synthesis. And someone else came into the lab and just couldn't believe how, because it was airborne at that point, and so ingested it and couldn't believe how bitter it was. He didn't detect anything, did this Dr. Fox. So being a good scientist, he actually tried it. He actually put it in his mouth and didn't perceive anything. So I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And then he went off to one of his conferences and brought this compound with him. Um, actually, no, it was a different compound. This is the, the, the initial compound that he worked with was found to be carcinogenic. So he since moved on to the propyl thiourosyl. But the initial compound, PTC, he, it was the same story. But pe some people were sensitive, some people not. But off he went to this conference. He brought this PTC compound with him. He gave it to a whole um, group of his peers, and then he was able to segregate the population to people who thought it was unbelievably bitter, people who thought it was bitter, but not you know, off the scale bitter, and then some people who couldn't perceive it at all. And so that's where they got into this research about super tasters. So um, when the compound, the PTC compound, was found to be carcinogenic, they were able to identify another compound that they could use, which is the um, propylthiourosyl or pro. So this is the compound that they use now when they're talking about super tasters, if you've ever seen them talk about that on the news. This tasting um, ability to taste this particular compound is produced by a dominant allele, with capital T. So if you're recessive, which are little t, they're non-tasters, they're not able to perceive this compound. So if you give them a cup of this compound and dissolved in solution, 
they are going to have it as a zero or a one on a 15 centimeter on a, on a line scale. They're not going to find it intense if they detect it at all. We have tasters, which is, um, it has one dominant and one recessive gene. And so they they can detect that it's bitter, but they don't say it's the most bitter thing that they've ever had. And then we've got the two dominant alleles, which are super tasters. And they would characterize this as the most bitter thing they have ever had. And so the scale is quite something. It ranges from nothing to the most bitter thing I've ever had. Which is, and so it's quite interesting to see people who, you can tell the super tasters when I'm doing this in a group because they just spit it out. You can see it on their face. But the non-tasters, I mean, nothing. It's very interesting. So that they found that you can divide the population into these three groups. About 50% of us are tasters, 25% are super tasters, and 25% are non-tasters. And this is for this specific compound. So just because you're not sensitive to this specific compound, there are many other bitter there are many other bitterness receptors, and you could be sensitive to another bitter compound. So um, and I just did this recently with a wine tasting panel. If I had one woman who was an extreme non-taster for the probe compound, but that didn't mean that she couldn't pick out um, quinine sulfate, which is another bitter compound. So it just depends. There's different compounds that we have sensitivity to, but this is the compound that I've identified that genetic component with. Um, there are also physical tasters between, um, sorry, physical difference between tasters and non-tasters. So probe tasters have a higher number of taste pores for papillae. They have an increased density of taste buds. So there are physical, physiological differences between non-tasters and super tasters. Um, so we've got this probe tasting, testing, which does give you that information about whether you're a taster or a non-taster, but I just wanted to also say that anatomical differences may be a better indicator of that. So the probe tasting, is, it's easy enough to do. We do it at all of our panels. We also, um, and, and with groups, because it's something that's pretty easy to do. You taste two solutions and you evaluate the intensity of them, um, but anatomical differences do sort of confirm that information. With all of our panels, we do collect this information because it can give us information about how people are evaluating the intensity of things. So if we find that one of our trained panelists is really having a hard time with astringency, for example, or bitterness, and we might we can look back and say, okay, wow, they're a non-taster. So that explains some things. Now there are gender differences. More women tend to be super tasters. And this, um, this superiority may decrease with age. The, gen the, the component of being a super taster because it's genetic is always present. It's not going to go away. But the sensitivity can vary. Um, and they have shown, showed um, a study to show a relationship between bitterness, sensitivity, and taster status. And super tasters found glucosinolate containing vegetables 60% more bitter. So that's broccoli and Brussels sprouts and those type of compounds that are found in different vegetables. They've done a lot of meta studies on this where they've looked at food choices associated with whether you're super taster or non taster. And they've also found that um, the women tend, the women super tasters tend to be thinner because they're not as sensitive to, they, they're too sensitive to fat and sugar. It's just too much for them, so they don't consume as much. They've also found that people who have chronic, who have difficulties with chronic consumption of alcohol tend to be non tasters because they are not as sensitive to alcohol than than those who are tasters and um, super tasters. So the next slide I'm going to show is a specific study that looked at wine and probe sensitivity. This was in red wine. And um, we had, there were 25 people and they were screened and classified as non-tasters, tasters, and super tasters. And then they were given a commercial, commercial red wine and they rated the astringency, bitterness, and acidity of those wines. And they wanted to compare the three groups to each other. And so the next slide shows this. So we've got our bitterness, astringency, and acidity along the bottom, our attributes, and then we have perceived intensity. So that's how intense that particular group found it. We have the non-taster group, which is the open square, and then the super taster, which is the dark colored square, and then the taster group, which is in between the middle. And what we see is that for bitterness, different letters represent significant differences from each other or real differences that are outside of chance. So what we see for bitterness is that the non-tasters evaluated that, found that wine to be significantly less bitter than did the tasters and super tasters, but there was no difference between the two taster and super taster groups. We see the same trends for astringency and for acidity. So what this suggests is that there are big differences between non-tasters, super tasters, and tasters, but within tasters and super tasters, not much of a difference, and not significantly. And so this was for a commercial red wine that was evaluated. So that if um, you may find yourself in that non-taster category, and if you look, you still see that people who are non-tasters are still detecting 
Um, so detecting bitterness, astringency, acidity, it's not like they're not able to perceive it. They're just finding it as less intense than the super tasters. So moving on from taste, we're going to talk about flavor now. And this is defined as the impressions perceived by the chemical senses from something that's in the mouth. So it includes aromatics. It includes those orthonasal compounds that we talked in webinar two. Those are the ones that come straight up your nose. The retronasal compounds, those are the compounds that are released from the wine once it's in the mouth. So they also get to the olfactory epithelium, which is up here. They just get by a different route. So they kind of come over the back. And so if you've got a cold, that area is clogged up and you're not able to perceive flavors because those aromas aren't able to get to that olfactory epithelium. It also includes taste, the sweet, sour, and bitter, and then chemical feeling factors, which are all the most feel that we're going to be spending quite a while talking about. So flavor is an interaction of all of those things together. It's quite complicated. And this is another wheel. And so I've got a few wheels to show you this in this lecture today or webinar. So this is the wine flavor wheel. It was developed at the Niagara College. On the innermost um, component, it's very similar to what you see for the wine aroma wheel. It has one less spoke though. So the innermost part are the most general terms, and then you work your way out to more specific terms. So you can see if you if you smell, if your the wine is in the mouth, and you think, wow, this is fruity, you can go to the fruity spoke, and then from there it it um spokes out to a lot of specific attributes that you can decide if that's what you're talking about or not. Or you can just leave it as fruity. This this wheel also has a number of the flavors that may be associated with the wine. It can be useful, it can also be um it can also encourage you to look for those particular aromas or flavors if and especially and find them and which is especially problematic if they're not there. So if you're smelling a Riesling and you look down here at the Riesling and think, wow, is there lime? Sure there's lime. Whereas you may not have picked it up otherwise. So that's something to keep in mind with these. It is it does provide some information and does help you look for certain things. But then you have to remember this is helping me look for certain things. So and they may um may cause a bias and may cause you to find a particular attribute that you may not have otherwise have found. So now we're going to talk about mouthfeel. These are those tactile impressions they get from the wine once it's in the mouth. Um, so if you look at it as even texture. These are sensations that are activated by those free nerve endings that are scattered throughout the oral cavity. So these trigeminal fibers, they surround the taste buds and are randomly distributed. So that's why you really want it to, when you take in the wine, really swish it around, really gurgle with it, um, because it will change the sensory perception that you get from the wine. And we'll talk about that in the next few slides, but it's quite complicated. That there's a lot to kind of keep in mind for mouthfeel. It used to be more simplified, and now they've got a red wine mouthfeel wheel, a white wine mouthfeel wheel. There's a lot of specific terms, a lot of specific um, how-tos as far as evaluation as well. So these are some mouthfeel terms that you'll be seeing. Viscosity, thin or thick. So if you viscosity is the most simple term. Think of water versus a milkshake, how thick something is in the mouth. Um, if you compare a table wine to a dessert wine, there's going to be a difference in how thick it feels. Um, there's the feeling on the soft tissue in the mouth, so smoothness, if something's velvety, kind of a little bit fuzzy, if it's coarse, so if you start getting, it's, it's more, um, it's got more particulates in it, and then it's gritty. So those are some different terms that you can think of when you're looking at how does this feel in my mouth. Carbonation related, so if you're not having a carbonated, relate, if you're not having a sparkling wine, you wouldn't be using these terms, hopefully, unless it's flawed. Uh, there's bubbly, there's tingly, there's spritz, so kind of how it feels in the mouth. And then you've got body, which is the weight of the wine in the mouth, how it kind of feels in, on your tongue. So whether it's heavy or watery, light, full, rich, all of these terms. Um, and then chemical effects. So we've got things like astringency, which is that drying, puckering, dry um, mouthfeel. So to me, it feels like my, my teeth are wearing little socks. It feels very, very dry and kind of fuzzy. You've got burning, which is that ethanol. And then you may have something sharp, which may be associated more with sourness. Um, after feel, how long something lasts in the mouth after you're finished. You can also call it finish. And then temperature. So whether it's cool or whether it's warm. So if you have a white wine that's served directly out of the refrigerator versus a white wine served at room temperature, it's going to have different properties. It's going to feel different in the mouth. Now this next, the next figure that you're going to see is a mouthfeel wheel. This was developed by Dr. Gowell in um, 2000. It was developed out of Australia. And so what you see here is this is the, the red wine, generally the red, well mouthfeel wheel, but more specifically for red wine mouthfeel because it does have an astringency spoke and a feel. So if you can look in the innermost part, it talks about astringency and then it also, the feel we might call those more tactile sensations. So astringency is very complicated. It's not just drying. 
you can look out from astringency and go to drying. And then within drying, you can choose numbing, parching, dry. There's a lot of other attributes within that. And the way they developed this wheel was actually to give people different fabrics that they felt in their fingers while they were trying the wine and trying to relate what they're feeling between their fingers with the fabric versus what they're feeling in their mouth. And so that's how some of these terms like furry, velvet, suede, silk, chamois, those are all, those all came about with fabric, so the, the panels for feeling fabric. And I do this with some of my sensory testing. It's very difficult to do, to translate what you're feeling between your fingers, fabric-wise and tactilely, and what you're feeling in your mouth. But that's how the wheel was developed. But it does give you a lot of terms you can see. So there's a lot of um, a lot of additional vocabulary here beyond just what I've gone over. You know, I've given up some broad terms, but this is a lot more specific vocabulary if you really want to get into describing mouthfeel and being very very precise. Now this next one, it's a different that that first the mouthfeel wheel was developed in Australia. This is information that's coming out of ICV, which is the Institut Cooperatif du Vin, so it's out of France the Cooperative Wine Institute, this is their protocol for mouthfeel evaluation. So it's a little bit different from the previous wheel, but it does give you different information. It's a different way of evaluating it, and if it sort of speaks to you and you relate better to this, then, you know, whatever, whatever works for you. So with this mouthfeel evaluation, it's very specific. So I'm going to go over a few of the specifics just to kind of illustrate how, um, how very fine this is and how they're trying to get, a, get away from the variation that's caused by how people manipulate the sample in their mouth. So you put 10 samples into your mouth, 10 mils um, into your mouth, and there are six descriptors. So there's volume, there's acidity, there's tannin, there's astringency, dryness, and bitterness. And each of those are evaluated at a particular time point. So volume is defined as the intensity of the tactile pressure of the wine on the tongue or the lip. It's assessed within three seconds after putting the wine in the mouth. The acidity is assessed on the rear half of the tongue and it's within three seconds after evaluating volume. And then you've got tannin, and that's two seconds after you evaluate the acidity. So you run the tongue along the palate from the front to the back and see how much it kind of scrapes, so the gen how much friction you generate by moving your tongue from the front to the back. So the more friction you generate, the higher um, intensity of tannin you might, might be able to say that that wine has. Astringency is two seconds after tannin, and this is running the upper lip twice, or sorry, running the tongue um, twice against the upper incisor. And then we've got dryness, which was two seconds after astringency. And it tells you how to manipulate your tongue from front to back. And again, you're looking at how much friction you've generated. It's very similar to tannin, but it's a little bit later in the process. And then bitterness is two seconds after following dryness. So this is very, very specific, and it does take a, you know, as far as seconds go, you're counting seconds and evaluating these different mouthfeel components. If you're doing this, you may not be able to simultaneously evaluate other things like flavor, um, some, some of those more complicated flavors, because you're focusing on evaluating the mouthfeel. But th that's how specific it can get and how they're trying to control how you manipulate the sample once it's in your mouth, because that can generate a lot of variation as far as intensity of Canon. If you don't manipulate the sample the same way, if you don't move your tongue in the same way as somebody else next to you, they may get a different intensity. So that's just a way of standardizing. Now just some general notes about astringency. It can be confused with bitterness um, because of the location or how it takes us longer generally to feel astringency than other things. It tends to come out the same time as bitterness, so it takes longer to develop. And what happens is, is these astringent compounds, these um, polymeric compounds, they bind and precipitate our salivary proteins with tannins. So we have a certain amount of salivary protein, certain amount of saliva, certain amount of spit that's just rattling around in our mouth. And so when we first have our first sip of red wine, those compounds bind with the saliva that's already present. And so you're, you're okay. It doesn't seem that intense. You either swallow it or spit out the wine. As you continue to consume the wine, you basically start running out of saliva. You start running out of salivary proteins. And then you get the binding of these compounds with your teeth and with your tongue and with other things in your mouth, not with the saliva because you have less saliva that's present in the mouth. So um, it does, it does, you do get rid of the saliva. Again, you only have a certain amount in there and you get increased friction. It can be slow to develop, but it is a dynamic process, meaning that 
and, and, and in the previous slide where we talked about 10 seconds waiting, 2 seconds waiting, 3 seconds, you can see that it is, it is a dynamic process. It changes over time. What you perceive initially is maybe not what you're going to perceive after 10 seconds or after 15 seconds. Um, intensity and duration does increase with repeat sampling. Again, it's a function of the saliva. So you're sort of running low, running out of saliva. So the wine that you have at sip one and what you perceive as astringency may not be the same as a level of astringency you perceive at sip six. And we did research on that and clearly showed how intensity, especially in high town and wines, how that intensity of astringency increases with repeated sampling. Um, positive descriptors you may have heard associated with astringency, soft, round, or mature. Negative descriptors might be hard, green, young, persistent, chalky. So that's, if you think back to the mouthfeel wheel, those are some of the slopes that you may see. There's also an effect of salivary flow rate. So how much saliva you generate. So now we have another source of individual differences that may contribute to how much we perceive our astringency. So this slide shows that. The next slide, we've got, um, we've got at time zero, what, um, along the bottom axis, we have time after administration of stimulus. So at time zero, each person was given either distilled water, um, TAM, plus, so you've got tannin, just tannin, if you move up the, the right-hand side. We've got tannin plus ethanol, E-T-O-H is ethanol. We have tannin plus sucrose. In the middle, we've got Pinot Noir, so we actually have a commercial wine. And at the very top, we've got tannin plus tartaric acid plus sucrose. So we have tannin, which confers astringency, tartaric acid, which is sour, and sucrose, which is sweet. So we have each of those stimuli which are administered at time zero. And then what they do is they measure the saliva weight at one minute and after two minutes to see how saliva flow varies with what you're given. So what we can see here is that when you're given distilled water, you have a pretty low, you know, you can see what the base level of saliva flow, a saliva weight is about maybe about 0.25 grams. As you're given different compounds, you generate more saliva. So if we look at the tannin plus tartaric acid plus sucrose, now you've generated 1.5 grams of saliva, so that's quite a bit of saliva. So it does vary with what you're given. And so if you've got a wine that's really heavy or really high and astringency really high in sucrose, then you may generate more saliva than something, another wine that does not have the same parameters. There's, of course, there's differences in how, um, in our saliva flow rates individually. So how much saliva we produce varies from individual to individual. And those are data we gather as well when we're doing our trained sensory evaluation panels. We give them and administer at, at time zero a highly acidic solution. They spit that out and then they, they after they've expectorated that, they then spit out saliva for a full minute and then we can measure that and determine whether they're low, medium, or high rate of saliva release. And that gives us some information as well when we're looking at the perception of certain things, of astringency, of bitterness. It can give us good information there. So another, again, another source of variation in why you may not perceive things the same as somebody else next to you. Um, this is just showing the influence of um, sucrose on our perception of astringency. So I don't want to go into this too much because I'm actually running a little low on time. So we've got three figures here. And if we look, say, just, just at that first figure, figure A, where it looks at time to maximum intensity. And along the bottom, we've got the concentration of sucrose from 0% to 20%. And what we see is that as we increase the concent concentration of sucrose, we do, there's not much, but there's a little bit of effect on the um, time to maximum intensity. How long it takes for you to perceive astringency varies with how much sucrose is present. How much, so if you look at figure B, the maximum intensity, how high or how intense you're finding that particular solution does vary with the concentration of sucrose. So if you look in the dark circle at the top, that's the high tannin line. So what they find is that when there's no sucrose present, our maximum intensity is maybe about 750, 780. But when sucrose is present, it decreases to about 650. So what I wanted to show there is that the interaction, what goes on in the wine, what else is present, can influence our perception of specific things, of specific attributes. Now we talked about threshold last time in webinar two. So threshold is the minimal concentration that's required to um, to produce a change in perception. So with ethanol, it's the minimal concentration or the minimal change in ethanol concentration before consumers can tell a difference. So if you have a wine that's 13.5% alcohol and a wine that's 13.6% alcohol, the question is, can you perceive it? Yeah, you can tell there's a difference with analytical tools, but can you actually perceive the difference? So they did this study in two types of wine, Chardonnay and Zinfandel, a white wine and a red wine, to compare differences. 
And they looked at it for orthonasal and retronasal detection. So if you look at the orthonasal, that's up the front of the nostrils. If you look at the little figure, it illustrates there these aromas traveling right up the front of the nostrils, getting to the olfactory epithelium, which is that little yellow region in the little figure. Um, the retronasal, those are the aromas that are perceived once the product is in the mouth. So once the product's in the mouth, you can see that it's got that back arrow that leads to retronasal olfaction. It gets to the same area, it gets to the olfactory epithelium, it just gets there a different route. And so they looked at the detection of both of these. Orthonasal, again, that's the wine when it's in the glass and you're sniffing it. Retronasal is once the wine is in your mouth. And so they found that for Chardonnay, the um, ethanol concentration that needed to be, the concentration needed to be 0.5% or higher before people could tell that there was a difference. And um, so it would be between you know, 13 and 14 percent, they could tell, certainly tell a difference. Retronasal, it needed to be a little bit higher, the concentration, before they could tell a difference. It was around 1.1 percent. And that's because of everything else that's going on in the wine. It's more complicated to kind of tease out ethanol. But they need a concentration difference of about 1 percent in order to tell the difference. Then they repeated the same study in red wine. And they found out for orthonasal, so for aromas up the front of the nose, that the concentration just in ethanol needed, difference needed to be about 1%, 1.12%, whereas once it was in the mouth, it needed to be 1.3%, so quite a bit higher um, compared, to, compared to the orthonasal, and that's because of the competition. That's because of what else is going on in the wine. It's more difficult to pick out those, it's more difficult to pick out the ethanol when you've got tannins in there and you've got, you know, maybe some sourness and some bitterness. So um, what I wanted to show you there is that if you, that's something you can look at on the label of the wine. So you can look at the percentage alcohol that's found in there. Of course, it's going to vary with what else is going on in the wine. But this does give you at least a little bit of information about where you could expect to see differences, especially if you're quite sensitive to alcohol. Um, now, this is um, talking a little bit more about the impact of ethanol on wine. So this is an area of research I've done quite a bit in. So um, ethanol does change perceptions of aromas and flavors. It does tend to enhance the heat, of course. So the more ethanol you have, the more burning you're going to perceive. It can also enhance roughness. It can enhance bitterness. It can reduce perceived astringency, so you may perceive less astringency. And it can affect other volatile compounds. And I'll show you that in a moment, how it affects other smells that you may have, just because ethanol is a, sol is a solvent and it dissolves certain compounds better than others. This is one study that looked at the effect of ethanol on astringency and bitterness. And what they found was that it higher, uh, ranged from 0% alcohol to 15%, which is in the dark box. And they found that as they increased the concentration of astringency, um, the perception of ethanol decreased. I'm sorry, as they increased the concentration of ethanol, the perception of astringency decreased. And then they saw a reverse, reverse trend in bitterness. So at the higher concentration of ethanol, that wine was found to be more bitter than at the lower concentration of ethanol. Meaning that ethanol certainly does have an effect on perceived astringency and perceived bitterness. So it's not just you're going to get more burning, but it's going to affect how you're perceiving the astringency and the bitterness in those wines as well. And if we flip forward to look at specific aroma compounds, what we've got here are different flavor, different aroma notes, and then we've got the alcohol concentration along the bottom, ranging from 0 to 16%. So this is work we did a few years ago, but what we see is that if you look at the red boxes, those are floral, fruity, caramel, aroma, and flavor. What we see is that as alcohol concentration increases, we tend to see a decrease. Um, we tend to see a decrease in those notes. So as alcohol concentration increases from 8% to 16%, people tended to perceive less of these floral, fruity, caramel notes. Um, in similar trend as with earthy and herbaceous, which are in yellow, we tended to see. Um, those, those notes tended to decrease as we increased the concentration of alcohol, and we saw quite a striking reverse trend when we look at sulfur aroma and flavor. So as sulfur, as the concentration of alcohol increased, we tended to see increase in perception of those sulfur aromas and flavors, meaning they found the wines to have more sulfur aroma notes than the floral notes and the earthy and herbaceous notes. So the higher alcohol wines aren't just higher alcohol, they affect bitterness, they affect astringency, and they also affect um, some of these aroma compounds as well and those aroma attributes. So moving on with white wine mouthfeel. So this is um, a, mo a wine mouthfeel was developed for white wine about right here. It's also in the next slide. It was in 2008. It contains the taste parameters. And it also contains, if you look at it, it's got discrete and integrated sensations. 
So discrete sensations are divided into those that finish early and those that finish later. And then it's got integrated sensations, which consist of more than one sensation. So it uses a time dimension. And so if you look at it, at 12 o'clock are the things that you perceive first, and then you work your way around. I'm going the wrong way. You work your way around the wheel. And so you start at 12 o'clock and then work your way around. I'll talk about it in a moment when you've got it in front of you because it's hard to relate to it. Um, so descriptors are ordered clockwise. Um, and then I've got a couple notes here about ethanol, which is, I just wanted to put that in there. It's that kind of heat drying. And glycerol, which tends to be associated with viscosity. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at the white wine mouthfeel that you have in front of you. So when you first put it, the wine in your mouth, you'll start at 12 o'clock, which is that yellow spoke, which is sweetness. And you'll work your way through those tastes. The, the um, notes that are in that kind of salmon colored are associated with sparkling wine. So if you're not having a sparkling wine, you can kind of flip over that. But then we go into pucker and mouth water, and then we skip over these salmon terms if we're doing a white wine. And then we go to fullness and surface texture. Those are all, um, those initial ones were early, and then we start getting into finish notes. So when we look at finish, we tend to get, we get into things such as irritation, mouth coat, overall drying, and length. So we start with the early, the early notes, and then we get into the late notes of the finish, the things that are left in our mouth after we spit out the wine. Those are all considered to be discrete sensations. Integrated sensations are more complicated, and they consist of more than one sensation, more than one concept. And so you can look at them here. They all have different, all their different terms. And as I mentioned before, within integrated, the salmon colored terms are associated with sparkling wine. So this is getting pretty complicated. So we've got a red wine mouthfeel, which focuses a little bit more on fabrics. It's got the astringency spoke, and it's also got the tactile mouthfeel. And now we've got a white wine, a white wine um, mouthfeel wheel that it goes in perception in the order in which you're thought to perceive them once the wine is in your mouth, starting with sweetness. So starting with early finishing, going through to later finishing, and then you've got the integrated idea. So this is um, getting pretty complicated, but it's a good um, you know, look through it and see if there's any terms that kind of speak to you. And it does certainly help you tease out various mouthfeel aspects. So now moving on to serving temperature. This is work that we've done a num over a number of years, and I was drawn into it because there really isn't much scientific research out there that talks about serving temperature. There's a tremendous amount of anecdotal information. And um, when we started off in this research area, I was thinking, well, what should I serve this red wine at, um, you know, for our, for our research? Is, what temperature should we do? Just room temperature, or does it, does it really make a difference if it's a little bit lower? And so that's what brought us to this research area. Um, so there is a trigeminal receptor that does respond to temperature in our mouth, so we're able to pick that up. Um, cool temperature tends to enhance prickling and prolongs effervescence, and that's why we serve sparkling wine cold. Um, conventional serving temperatures, white wine, the cool temperature was thought to suppress sweetness and enhance acidity. Red wines, the warmer temperature is thought to suppress, suppress bitterness and astringency. Um, but in doing further reading, there really hasn't been much research done in the area, but the preferred serving temperature may primarily be a reflection of habit. So was there really a difference was our question. And so we attempted to answer that and are still working on this research because um, it's just there's a lot to learn. So this is the first set of studies that we did. Um, we looked at Pinot Grigio, which is the white wine, and we looked at Merlot, which is the red wine, and we served it at three different serving temperatures, um, four, four degrees, 10 degrees, and 18 degrees Celsius. So eight, four degrees is refrigeration temperature, 18 degrees Celsius is a little bit cooler than room temperature. And so what we found is there's differences in aroma as you increase the serving temperature. There were significant differences in aroma, and that, that's represented by those different letters. With sweetness and acidity, we did not find that there was a significant difference in people's perception of sweetness or acidity. Um, you tended, you saw a bit of a trend, but it wasn't consistent. Um, red wine, same sort of thing. We saw differences with aroma. Those serving temperatures were 14, 18, and 23. 23 is room temperature, and 14 is, um, well, a little bit colder than that. Um, and so it was out of, not as cold as refrigeration. It, being, it was cooled down to that temperature. We didn't hold it in the refrigerator. But it was probably cooler than most people would consume the red wine. And we found that there were no significant differences in astringency and bitterness. And it could have been a function of the wines that we worked with. So we are redo we're, we're doing white wine research again, not redoing it, but this is a real result, but we're doing continuing on with this area. And we did this um, research, or we continued on with it already in red wine temperature. So this is recently published research. We used a different type of methodology, something called mapping. And that is um, 
Nap is French for tablecloth. And so what we give to our panelists is a large piece of paper. And what they do is they, and then a series of wines, like eight wines or six wines, and they sit with those wines in front of them. They taste each of the wines and they cluster them based on how similar they are to each other. So if they think, they try the first wine and they set it over here, and then they taste the next wine and say, wow, that's really different from the first wine. I'm going to put it over here. They can use whatever parameters they want to distinguish the wine. So that's where the data analysis gets a little tricky. So they can use whatever they want. They can use sweetness. They can use astringency. Whatever attributes are meaningful to them to distinguish these wines. And so at the end of it, you have a tablecloth with their wines on it, and then you can um, have something, you have them do something called enriching it, where they write down how they separated the wines. And so we had them do that, and so what we did here was we had six different wines, and we, they're all Lemberger's. I was trying to work with a Washington Brio. Um, we served them at three different serving temperatures, and I have it translated down here from Celsius to Fahrenheit. So 50, 61, and 72 Fahrenheit, and these were, this was red wine. And they were all served to the panelists, and then they clustered them. And this is, looks, what we're graphing here are the different attributes that, they, that people could agree on. And then we have the number of mentions. So that's the number of people who mentioned this particular attribute is describing this sample. So translating all of that, if we look at bitterness in the top right, we've got the three serving temperatures, 10, 16, and 22. And what we see is that 22, a lot fewer people use the term bitterness to describe that sample that was served at 22 degrees Celsius, implying that it was less bitter. Um, and we look at astringency, we see that a lot fewer people at the high temperature use high astringency to define that, that particular sample, but more people use the term low astringency. So we did actually see in this, re, in, this, these, um, in this study, we did actually see differences in astringency and bitterness, and you can see all the, the differences that we did find among the wine samples. This is just a selection of the significant differences we saw. We had a huge number of terms that were generated. People perceive all kinds of things. Okay, so moving on to overall impressions, and then we'll finish it up with a little bit with wine, with a little bit of um, wine faults. So we talk about wine finish, which is short versus long, and those are taste aromas that linger after either swallowing or expectorating the wine. In the past, the vocabulary has been sort of short, which is a, a, a short reminder of the wine, and then long finish, which is it kind of like kind of lingers there. It's kind of nice. We've done some research in this area that I'll quickly go over. In white wine, we looked at the effect of oaking on Chardonnay on finish time. And then in red wine, we looked at the effect of different components of the red wine on finish time. In Chardonnay, this is right here, we've got percent oak, and these are commercial Chardonnays that we purchased. There was an unoaked Chardonnay, there was a highly oaked Chardonnay, and then there was sort of a medium oak Chardonnay that we're calling there. And what we see is that of the three, um, if you look in the top figure, people liked, Hedonic Mean was along a seven-point scale, people liked the 0% Chardonnay the best, the, the unoaked Chardonnay the best, they like the highly oak Chardonnay the least of the three samples. We also did a willingness to purchase, so we asked them how much they'd be willing to pay for these wines and how willing they would be to buy the wines. And we found that they were um, more willing to buy the less oaky wines. They wanted a non-oaky Chardonnay. Um, and in addition to asking people how much they liked the finish, we also sent each consumer into the booth with a, with a stopwatch. And they actually put the wine in their mouth, they spit it out, and then they hit the timer and they timed how long that wine took to finish. And we actually found that was, we, had, we had some really good results with 60 consumers. It was very impressive. So what we found is for the high oak wine, it took about 53 seconds to finish, so almost a minute, whereas for the unoaked wine, it took about 45 seconds to finish. And that was just people sitting in there with a the timer recording how long that oaky, um, oaky flavor lingered in their mouth. So we did find that there were people were able to perceive that, and there were differences. This is more recent work in red wine. This is a Syrah that we took. We de-alcoholized it and we brought it back to two alcohol levels, a 10 and 16%. The 10 is the low alcohol and the 16 is the high alcohol. And what we and then we um, um, we also added different compounds to it. We added a bell pepper compound, a coconut compound, and a floral compound. And what we found was that for all the high ethanol samples, all of these compounds took longer to finish. So in bell pepper, the high alcohol sample to finish 7.7 7 .7 seconds later than the low alcohol. For coconut, it was about 6.8 second difference. And for floral, it was quite large. It was about 12 second difference in the high alcohol wine that floral stuck around in your mouth longer than in the low alcohol wine. We did a similar study, but this time we varied tannin levels. So we had a high astringency wine and a low astringency wine. 
We didn't find differences with coconut and floral, but we certainly did with bell pepper. So the, the bell pepper, it took longer to finish in the high tannin wine. It tended to stick around longer. So we are finding differences due to the composition of the wine, due to the alcohol concentration, and then also due to um, the tannin concentration as well. So that does affect our finish. So moving on with overall impressions, um, we talk about complexity in a wine, which is the presence of many distinct, um, of many distinct elements. Um, how many discrete things can you sort of pick out of this wine? We also talk about balance or harmony. And this is, refers to equilibrium where individual perceptions do not dominate. So there's not one thing that jumps out of you, there's sort of harmony. And I mentioned this earlier on, maybe in webinar one, it tends to be something you don't notice until it's absent. Because you might try wine and think, wow, this is, I am just, all I'm getting out of this wine is sourness. Well, that would imply that the wine is not balanced. There's, it's not very harmonious. Um, it's also looking at the balance, and depending on the wine, but balance between different sensations. So if you've got a table wine, having a balance of sweetness and sourness. As I mentioned before, if you've got a dessert wine, you may not have that balance, but that's okay. If you think the same thing is with food. If you have something, you want something to be intentionally very spicy, then it might not be in balance. And again, that's okay if that's what you're expecting. Body can balance astringency, and then you can have heat or alcohol that balances um, acidity. So depending on what else is going on in the wine, these different things interact. Other elements of overall impressions, so development. These are changes in the aromatic character that occur during sampling, during tasting, during evaluation. How does the wine change over time? How does it develop? Um, duration, how long the fragrance retains a unique character. So how long can you smell oakiness? How long does, can you tell that's still oakiness? Um, interest is how interested are you? Are you going to buy this wine again? Are you going to tell people about it? Was it worth the money that you spent? Um, and the memorableness, similarly. Was it unforgettable? Were you, would you buy it again, I think is the question. Would you buy it again for $20? What if it was 10 would you buy it again? You know, all these ways of evaluating how much you like something and how much you value something. So those are all things to kind of take into account. What this, this study looked at recognizing wines, and what it found was that people have different abilities to recognize different wines from each other if they're given two wines of the same varietal. So it can be harder for them to detect tell um, Sangiovese um, apart from each other, but if they're given two samples of Chardonnay, they can tell that them a little bit easier. It's easier for them to tell them apart from each other. So this is the ability to recognize different varietals, maybe due to different growing regions or different areas or even just something, um, even just different wineries. So people's ability to recognize different wines differs. It can also be easier for them to recognize um, that wines are different from each other versus they're the same varietal. Now moving swiftly on, we've got wine faults. These are wine faults that are in mouth. Um, most of the wine faults we talk about are obvious to the nose, meaning that you can smell them. Most of them you can pick up in the aroma. And they need really only confirmation by the palate, except for a few that I'm going to talk about. One being metal contamination. That's something you don't usually pick up until it's in your mouth. But we've got our gustatory faults as well. Um, this refers to something like the structure of the wine. Are the elements in balance? Well, we just talked about that. Is it harsh or sour? Because that could be considered a flaw. Is it excessively tannic? Is it very bitter? Is it really astringent? Meaning that it may not be astringent if it had a high enough alcohol concentration or if something was competing and balancing with it. It's really that if it's out of balance, it's going to be, appear to be too something or other. Other things, excessive alcohol, this refers to a wine being too hot, too high, um, too high in ethanol. And um, commercial wines have certainly increased in alcohol concentration. So in the 1970s, you're looking at 13% alcohol, and that would have been a big wine. Now we're looking at 15%. We have some wines in the lab that we've bought commercially that are 16.3%. So very, very high in alcohol. I mean, almost fortified wine territory. So some of these wines, if they don't have anything else competing with that high alcohol, that's all you're going to get. And as we showed previously in this webinar, it can affect the aromas that you get out of the wine, as well as the perception of bitterness and, and um, astringency. So it's not just going to exist on its own. Another thing to think about is harsh tannins. So the tannin and the astringency. So these are tannins that are responsible for wine astringency. It's a component of mouthfeel. And you think back to those mouthfeel wheels and the um, attributes you evaluate for mouthfeel. And so it's very much a component, very much something that's present in red wine. And um, just a little bit of information about where the tannins come from, um, from the seeds and the rest of the grapes. So a lot of it is 
um, tannin management in the winemaking and in the vineyard. So it's kind of both places that they manage these tannins. But it is something to keep in mind that if it's out of balance, it comes across as a flaw and something not desirable in your wine. So I think that takes me to the very end of the webinar, and I'd like to thank you for your time. If you have questions, I think you can send them in. I can either answer them online, I can ask, try to answer them now, or I can also, if you want to email me any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, thank you for attending the webinars. I hope you learned something about wine tasting, and um, have fun with it. Thank you everyone for tuning into our Wine Sensory Evaluation webinar series. If you have any questions for Dr. Ross, please feel free to post those in KoogSync and we will get those answered for you.